Hello everyone, my name is Matt and I make pixel art and games. I'm hoping this will be a very concise yet detailed overview of everything you need to know about color and pixel art. I'll be covering some color basics, how to make a palette, and where to get a pre-made one if you're lazy like me. Then we'll talk for a bit about how to select our colors effectively before we start a drawing or tile set. So let's jump right into it. First off, why do we need a palette? One answer is that traditionally pixel art was restricted because of old gaming hardware that didn't have a lot of color choices, but nowadays we still do it stylistically. Most pixel art looks best with very few colors, since too many can just make it look weird and blurry. A second answer is that it makes the whole process a lot easier and more cohesive. If we were to just dive right in and try to randomly pick whatever colors we thought would look nice, we'll quickly find that they don't. I could sit here trying to tweak each color one at a time, but luckily pre-selecting them in a palette makes our lives much easier, and helps us nail our desired mood as quickly as possible. So on to the creation of the palette. We first need to decide on a mood before we actually get going on palette creation, and in order to start nailing down the mood, we need to define some key terms. Hue, saturation, and value. You may be used to seeing this format denoted as HSV in art software. The hue of a color is basically, well, what base color it is on the color wheel. You can see this slider here adjusts the hue. We then have saturation, which I like to think of as the dryness of a color, or how much pigment is in it. With zero saturation, it's just gray. There's no hue in it at all, but when we max out saturation, it becomes very vibrant and juicy looking. Our final characteristic is value. This is essentially how dark the color is. Basically, it's how much black we add to the color. We can adjust this by moving up and down in this box. Let's take a look at some sample palettes and art pieces that show the extreme ends of these characteristics. Here's a palette with very high saturation. We find that the associated drawing comes off as somewhat cartoonish and a bit more carefree. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got a palette with very low saturation. We see that it's quite the opposite of the previous one. Instead of being very cartoony and carefree, it's much more serious looking. When we look at value, we find that pieces that are a bit darker feel, well, darker, in the sense that they're more serious, spooky, etc. Then lighter pieces usually appear happier, generally speaking. And then we get to hue, which has some more nuance to it, but we'll cover that later on when we talk about using color effectively. For now, we'll just make a comprehensive palette that covers most hues. So let's say we're making a carefree farm sim game. It won't be too serious, so we can probably go a bit higher on the saturation, and in general we won't need a ton of dark colors. Let's start by choosing a color that we know is important. I'd say green, since there will be lots of plants. We can navigate over here to the green area, and just pick a color. I've noticed that people tend to choose colors that are a bit more saturated than they really should be to start, so don't be afraid to pull to the left a bit and dry that color out. I'm going to choose something in this middle range. It also looks very green right now, almost like some sort of radioactive ooze. I'd like to maybe go a bit more towards yellow. If you want to cheat a bit with a sprite to edit a color, you can hit Ctrl U and open up this window. It lets you slide around the hue, saturation, and value a bit until you're happy with them. Once we have this first color, we can make what we call a ramp. This will basically be a way for us to go from dark green to light green smoothly. Here are some examples of ramps from some other palettes. Now one thing here that's super important is hue shifting. This is the number one mistake I see people make, and the principle is pretty simple. You may think that to make a color brighter or darker, you can just change the value to bring it towards white or black. In reality, color doesn't work this way. When it becomes brighter, it approaches the color of the light that's being used, and when it gets darker, it approaches the color of the natural darkness of the scene, usually a dark violet or blue. So all this is to say, when we try to make some colors for our ramps, when we lighten, we will shift a bit towards yellow, and when we darken, we will shift a bit towards violet. Let's give it a shot. We'll snag this color here and we'll make it slightly darker. We'll then shift a tiny bit towards violet. Now, how extremely you want to shift here is up to you. If your shifts are more dramatic, it'll make things pop a bit more, so don't be afraid to experiment. I'll go ahead and keep going here, slowly making the screen darker and darker and hue shifting as I go. As you're moving along, you may find that you'll struggle to find a color exactly between two other colors. You've got your green, you've got your slightly darker bluey green, but say you want a perfect in-between color. I've got a nice little trick for that. We can just copy one of them and then sample the other one with our eyedropper tool. We then go over here and change the opacity to roughly 50% and draw over that other color. And there we have it, a nice in-between color. This brings us to one of our last big considerations. How dark and light do we go? Should we go all the way to black and white or stop somewhere before? Let's take a look at two art pieces, one that goes all the way to black and one that stops before. You'll notice the one that doesn't go all the way into dark black looks a bit less dynamic. Maybe it has a bit more dry feel to it, if that makes sense. A bit washed out. This is a stylistic choice, I think most games go pretty deep into black, but I do remember seeing DevDuck use the Zooey32 palette for his game, which is notoriously lighter. I personally like to, at least at first, go pretty deep into a dark violet for my black color, to the point where it's pretty much black. Same with white. I personally just stick to something that's almost all the way white. We can always lighten or darken the palette later if we want, I'll show that later. 
so I'll pick a few more colors that I think are important, and make a couple more ramps, always going to the same black and white eventually. This is important for game art especially. You really want to end up with one color that you know is darkest, and one color that you know is lightest. You would hate to have these black outlines around characters, only to have your environment be even darker, making it look weird. So once we've got a few ramps, we can start connecting them. I like to orient them like this, kinda like an onion. Ultimately, we want any color to be able to find its way to black or white. Sometimes the ramps can branch as well. Say we want another green that has a bit more blue to it. We can take this green we want to branch from and slowly shift towards a more bluish green. If you don't really know where to branch from, that's fine, it just takes some practice. We can just start by placing other ramps and then seeing if there are any branch opportunities. Say we made our darker green ramp and thought, huh, those darker colors are pretty similar, they can probably share. That's a good move. Ultimately, if two colors are close enough, you can probably just merge them into one. So I'll just continue to add colors here. At the end of the day, I know I want all the primary colors, all the secondary colors, some grays, browns, and tans, and then maybe a wider variety of greens than usual. Once we do all those, we end up with a complete palette. I ended up with 32 colors in this palette, which is pretty standard for pixel art palettes. Usually it's 16, 32, or 64, some multiple of 8. Now we find this palette looks pretty solid, but maybe there are some small tweaks we want to make. You definitely don't have to do this if you're happy with what you got, but if you so desire, you can hit Ctrl U and make some slight adjustments. I don't advise doing anything drastic here, but you can slightly change the saturation if you want to make it pop a bit more or less if you didn't quite nail it earlier on. You can also slightly shift the hue, but be advised that only tiny little tweaks will be okay here. Additionally, say you realize you didn't like how dark the black is. Problem is, if you try to change it to be lighter, you'll have to change all the ramps too. Luckily, you can do it all at once. Just make a new layer and put it behind our palette. Make this layer full of your lightest color. In this case, that's our white right here. Then, on your layer that has the palette, double-click the layer and make it slightly transparent. Now we're able to see through all our darker colors, so they appear to be less dark. Once you get it how you like it, you can right-click the top layer and merge it down, making the change permanent. You'll have to get rid of all this white, but just don't erase all the white since, you know, it's still a color in our palette. If you instead wanted to make everything darker, do the opposite. Put in the darkest color in your palette and repeat the same process. This will make all the colors a bit darker. One last thing we can do, this one's a bit more drastic, but can be fun on smaller palettes. Say we wanted the whole thing to be a bit more yellow. We can make a new layer above our palette and fill it with yellow. We can then make it mostly transparent. Now it's kind of like we're looking at our palette through a yellow piece of stained glass. If you like this, you can merge the layers and get rid of some of the excess yellow everywhere. If you didn't like how it made our blacks and whites so much more yellow, we can, before we merge, double click the layer and change it to the overlay mode. This makes it so the yellow layer does some math with the layers beneath it instead of just acting like a normal layer. We may have to make it a bit more visible, but you can see that it's affecting the colors, but not lightening or darkening them a ton. This might be nice for tiny tweaks at the end, but don't go too crazy with it. And there we have it. You've successfully made a palette. Now we just need to get it loaded into a sprite. First off, we can line up the colors nicely in this A-Sprite file. I like to have one pixel for each color. You don't have to do just one pixel, I just think it looks nice. Let's line up our ramps nicely so they appear in a reasonable order when we import it. Get rid of any other colors that you don't want to be in the final palette. Once you have the colors all ordered, you can export this as a PNG somewhere safe. I have a folder I call Palettes. Let's put it there. Then in A-Sprite, you can click here, press Load Palette, and then select the PNG from the folder that you just made. You'll then see that your palette appears here. You can select a color and draw with it, just like normal. One fun shortcut is if you hold ALT while using the scroll wheel on your mouse, it'll cycle through them. I use that a lot. Now, say you didn't want to go through all that trouble. You just want to get a pre-made palette and go nuts. This is what I do most of the time since I'm really lazy. There's a website dedicated specifically to pixel art palettes called lowspec.com. If you head over there and go to the palette list, you can find a bunch that people have made. You can sort by size and use whatever looks nice to you. If you want to download one, you can simply download it as a PNG and slap it in a folder somewhere, then go into A-Sprite and load it the same way as we did before. Some sample ones to get your feet wet that I highly recommend are EDG32, AAP64, and Zooey32. Or of course mine, Watt32. So if you're like me, you've got this palette, but sometimes struggle to know exactly which colors to use at different times. For example, why did they paint the walls of this building blue? And in Hyperlight Drifter here, well, why is this floor blue? And why use a bright yellow sky here? Most of these choices boil down to some common color schemes that look good together, so we'll go over these. The first major color combination is the monochromatic color scheme. If you draw on a monochromatic scheme, you are only using one color. You can use darker and lighter versions of this color with your hue shifting to a tiny bit, but for the most part, you're just using one. 
Would I have a game be monochromatic? Sure. Hollow Knight does this a lot. You'll notice many of their scenes consist of sometimes just one color with varying value. Since the character itself is pretty much just gray and white, it blends in quite well with any color. I think this typically makes for some pretty serious, dystopian, or washed out looking games. Can definitely be an interesting choice. I don't think I'd use a single color for the entire thing, but individual scenes can certainly be monochromatic. As for standalone art pieces, it can make for lots of fun pixel art. You'd basically just be using one of your ramps, and it provides an interesting limitation. The second major color combination is the complementary colors. These are colors that are opposite on the color wheel. Green and red are complementary colors, orange sense opposite blue, and violet is complementary to yellow. These colors fight each other a lot, which really makes them pop. Looking back at the Celeste drawing, the whole thing kind of explodes in your face. They also use this in movie posters to make things really jump out, and it can be a solid choice. Have purple goo and need to come up with a color for the pipes in your factory? Make them yellow. We even see in Hollow Knight that Hornet's dress is red, making her really pop when we meet her in Green Path. I don't think this is a coincidence. The third combination is analogous colors. These are ones that are right next to each other on the color wheel. These will look a bit more cohesive next to each other and make for some good, stable color choice. A tan path with some green trees and reddish rocks will look wonderful next to each other. Or maybe have some pink wisteria trees against a purple mountain under a blue night sky. Next up is the triadic color scheme. So named because it forms a triangle on the color wheel, these colors will also look nice next to each other. If you absolutely need orange and purple in your scene, but you can't get them to look nice since they don't fit super well with the other options, adding a touch of green will help balance it out. Although it's a bit hard to tell, this scene from Hyperlight Drifter contains a roughly triadic color scheme, which you can see here on the color wheel. There's finally the tetradic color scheme, which forms a square. I just like to think of it as two sets of complementary colors working together. And one last thing before we move on. Colors also tend to have their own feelings associated with them. It's not an exact science, but red is typically associated with danger, green is associated with energy or creativity, while yellow is happy. Black usually symbolizes death or power, Blue can make something seem calm or wise, while violet is associated with wealth. Finally, white is usually indicative of purity or peace. These are all somewhat obvious when you think about it. Yellow is indeed a happy color, and I'd imagine a big bad guy to have a lot of red. That's why they made Palpatine's room in Revenge of the Sith be red after all, they were foreshadowing that he was evil. So just go with your gut here, and you don't have to rely on this too much. Additionally, colors can either be warm or cool. These colors are warm, and these ones are cool, as you'd expect. Typically, the warmer colors indicate more energy, while the cooler ones are a bit more calm. This one might be a bit of a stretch, but have you noticed in Lord of the Rings, as they lurk through Moria, it's mostly cool colors, but when the Balrog goes on his rampage and they're running for their lives, the scenes are mostly warm? As the action picks up, so did the colors in the scene. Sure, the Balrog is made of flames and it's a natural consequence, but it really helps bring the scene to life and add intensity. It's also important to note that any of these colors can be warm or cool. Red is a warm color, but there can be a warmer and a cooler version of it. It's all relative. If your scene is all red and you've got a red that's a bit further towards blue, it'll look slightly cooler in comparison. So when do we actually use all of this information that I just blasted out? Before I make the tiles for a new dungeon or new area, I try to decide which colors in my palette I want to primarily use. Maybe just pick two to three. What do we want it to feel like? Is it a spooky area that's dark, abandoned, and calm? I'd maybe use analogous colors, perhaps that are cooler to make things seem peaceful. Maybe it's a fast-paced factory with tons of enemies around every corner. I'd likely do something complimentary so it pops a bit more, maybe with some more emphasis on the warmer colors to help bring out some intensity. The same applies for a regular piece of art. Some useful tools are this color wheel site, canva.com. I'll link it down below. I use this a lot when I need to visualize the color wheel. I also really like coolers.co. It's pretty great. You can randomize until you get a color you like. You lock it in and then cycle the rest until you're completely content. This is a nice way to generate color schemes without thinking too hard. Just make sure you pick stuff similar to what's in your palette. Also, don't be afraid to deviate from the palette every now and then, especially with saturation. I find that if my floors are all very vibrant and bright, it can be hard to see the player. So I like to make all my floors a bit desaturated so the player can stand out a bit more. I just color it like normal and then hit good old Control U to slide the saturation down a tiny bit. One final tip that I find useful. Generally speaking, the art should look good in just black and white. I was watching somebody struggle to choose colors the other day, and I found that they had some issues with contrast. They were drawing this farm landscape, and their foreground in this image looked too busy. And it's pretty easy to see why when we get rid of the color. The path here is very light, making it stand out a lot when we don't want it to. These dark patches are also drawing the eye a lot. Do we want the viewer to be looking at these random blotches? No, they aren't important. Once we made those less contrasting, it made the end result look a bit nicer. So basically, if something looks weird with your coloring and part of the drawing looks too cluttered, don't be afraid to lower your saturation and glance at it in black and white. Maybe there's something obviously high contrast when you don't want it to be. 
that's pretty much all I have to offer regarding color. A lot of this is pretty theoretical and more just stuff to keep in mind rather than hard principles that must be abided by. We'll end up with a lot more useful, tactile methods in the texture and shading tutorials later on, but this should help set the stage for those. So hey, if you like what you saw in this video, I've got a Patreon where you can help support me to keep these videos coming. There are lots of rewards there too, so don't be afraid to check them all out. I've also gone full-time with my art and game development using commissions and freelance work, so every cent in the Patreon helps this poor starving artist. You can also learn more about my game, IO Goblin, at the site below or any other videos on my channel. And of course, don't forget to hit subscribe and like the video to tell YouTube to not be embarrassed of me. I also have a long list of ideas for my next tutorials, but let me know in the comments below if there's anything you really want to see. And as always, I appreciate everyone dropping by, and I'll see you next time. Hello everyone, the time has come to shout out our eternally gracious patrons. I'd like to give a super special shout out to our Goblin Deity patrons for June 2022, namely Zachary Nice, Sarah Larif, Jared Tucker, Joey Mayer, Charles Philibig, TX Redcore, Geoffrey Harden, Riley Smith, Clinton Barr, RX, Brett Hudson, Anna B, Julian Dickin, Jackson Singleton, Matthew Spencer, Jace, and Hannah. You're all amazing and I appreciate all of the support.